Honorable President, Architect Viranjan, and esteemed members of the Sri Lanka Institute of Architects, I am honored to give this keynote address to such an august and respected professional gathering. This occasion has special meaning for me personally. As four decades ago, I was invited by the government of Sri Lanka to prepare the master plans for six provincial capitals here in Sri Lanka. These cities were Jaffna, Ratnapura, Kalutara, Gaul, Matara, and Hambantota. This assignment, running for several years, took me across your beautiful country from north to south, engaging me with your people, with your culture, with your history, and with your intriguing geography. It also introduced me to your emerging problems of urbanization and national integration. So my romance with Sri Lanka is a very old and a very deep-rooted one. The theme of this national conference, the social responsibility of the architect, is what really attracted me to join you here at your conference today. Our friend, architect Sinaka, shared your theme paper, emphasizing that architects are thought leaders and are prominent members of the intellectual community, and that we are responsible to ideate new visions and directions for society. It is the responsibility of architects to guide spatial development and economic growth while ensuring social equality by participating as urban designers and urban planners. You are perhaps the first national body of architects to come to terms with the fact that an architect is more than just the designer of poetic objects. Like it or not, we are urban designers, city planners, and regional planners. We are important national policy advisors responsible for designing safe public spaces, focusing on hygiene, health, and disaster management. It is our duty to convey that design and planning are comprehensive subjects, engaging all aspects of human existence. We are also futurologists. Our profession prefers us only to act in the future. We, as architects, always act in the future tense. We must always look forward. On the contrary, accountants are always looking backwards at last year's incomes and expenses and assessing tax implications, while lawyers are arguing contentions of past years and doctors are trying to ameliorate our old bad habits. So this conference is a kind of major breakthrough for architects all over the world to accept reality and to take on the greater responsibility thrust on us as designers. It is our responsibility to our communities to proactively design secure and alluring spaces. We have to catalyze macro-level planning through ideas like green corridors and public space systems. You hit the nail on the head when you stated that our endeavors have a deeper meaning beyond competing for visual attention and beyond striving for architectural glamour. Our role is to serve mankind rather than to create spectacular monuments. This conference imagines the architect moving out of, the, of a concern for pretty individual buildings into the public arena of community architecture. I propose that there are four paths through which we can promote our agenda. These paths are, one, creating access to public spaces. Two, creating access to humane shelter. Three, creating access to basic service facilities like primary health and primary education. And four, educating future generations of architects to focus on the above three paths. Path one, create access to public spaces. Creating public spaces is an arena where our fraternity, working together as an individual or as individual architects, can make positive impacts that reaches everyone and not just the elite few. For most citizens, public spaces are their only social meeting places, breakout spaces, areas for physical development. Yet these are generally available to the public only by default. 
disorganized leftover areas between buildings become our public spaces. Our streets become the public spaces where children are forced to play, dodging traffic. Streets have become our footpaths and our sidewalks. Communities are forced into the streets where chaotic traffic moves and hawkers are competing for survival. For most people in South Asia, our public spaces are not organized, are logically laid out areas. They are unintended default and leftover spaces. Where they exist, public spaces like the golf face in Colombo and the Maidans of Mumbai and Kolkata become the key memory points of their cities. Temple tanks, river edges, and seaside beaches often are the only refuges for people living in smaller towns. Older urban areas are rich with pedestrian lanes and lovely courts, but these are slowly being gentrified like the Gulf Fort to attract high-end foreign tourists. There are wonderful examples of architects preparing street plans, cleaning up urban messes, adding paved footpaths, designing benches, and providing trash cans. Street lighting, shade trees, attractive planting, and storm drains transform chaos into civility. Architects have taken old historic streets and reconstructed them, adding sanitary facilities, footpaths, street lights, and proper storm drainage. If I look at Chani Chok in Delhi, it is a revitalization plan of old Delhi, and it's a very good example. Likewise, the Delhi Hot took an unsanitary open drain, piping out the waste and covering it over, creating a vibrant place for craftspeople and curious shoppers. In Ahmedabad, the walled city, which accommodates 600,000 people, did not have even one square foot of orderly open space. The Sabramati Riverfront Project gifted these people an extensive, beautiful riverfront with boating, cycling, jogging, and cultural events. Such initiatives can be taken up by architects in their own neighborhoods, creating pocket parks, or simply planning footpaths with street curbs and storm drains. There can be overhead lights and dustbins. In Perth, creative architects began a what-if movement identifying 10 rundown urban areas, challenging architects, students, and the general public to submit plans for enhancing the comfort and safety and delight of these areas, turning liabilities into assets. In Sri Lanka, our institute can have a national what-if movement, catalyzing communities to become aware of their public spaces and the potentials of designing for a better tomorrow. May I suggest that each Sri Lankan architect take the street in front of their own home, our office, and prepare a simple plan for it. May I suggest that each town, the local architect's chapter, identify a derelict area and turn that civic liability into a community asset. Our studio's work is always fo focused on a public space. We try to bring an important public space into each project. In Suzlon One Earth, we created a large central park with a waterfall and an imposing traditional votive lamp tower, our deep stumba. In our global brain research center in Shanghai, we have introduced a large classical Chinese garden accessible to an urban district. In our urban design for the Bhutanese capital complex, we created the National Ceremonial Plaza in Tempu, where thousands of people can gather. In our commercial projects in Pune, like Tain Square, our Loda Belmondo, we have made public open space the unique selling points of our projects. In all of our projects, we start with a question, what if? What if we can create generous public space as the central focus of our design? Path two, create access to humane shelter. We need to study people living in our cities, towns, and villages. We need to estimate what percentage of inhabitants ever visit an architect design house. We need to estimate how many of our citizens live in design residences. I suppose less than 3%. If one studies the ability to pay of households in India, 
less than 3% of our population are even eligible to apply for a housing loan. The rest of our communities are not qualified to make equated monthly installments over years, paving the way to buy their own shelter. In a country where less than 3% of the people pay income tax, and the submission of three continuous years income tax receipts is the required beginning point to apply for a housing loan, access to shelter looks really bleak. Where we have highly subsidized housing, or even give free housing under the Slum Rehabilitation Act, only a tiny fraction of the poor is reached. These free city center units are quickly resold for market value or are let out to higher income renters, allowing the scheme beneficiaries to encash the actual market values. The reality is that a large low income segment of urban households build their own houses with their own hands, recycling materials and using very appropriate technologies, but illegally on other people's land. We all know that the major barrier blocking shelter solutions is the lack of land. Yet when economic deregulation and direct foreign investment emerged in India, we initiated a special economic zone policy. We call it the SEZ. These enabled large industrial houses to capture hundreds of acres of peri-urban farmlands to create industrial estates. These SEZs are planned as monofunctional zones of several hundred, even several thousand acres. These SEZs only have very large, big plots for large-scale manufacturing. There are no provision for housing. There are no provisions for small and medium ancillary fabrication or small-scale industries. There are no provisions for basic health and education services. There are not even plots reserved for technical and skilled training. This is happening all over the world where similar statutory mechanisms could be widened in scope. This core idea could be expanded to become what I call special habitat zones, or SHZs, that would include a range of manufacturing sizes from large to small, including fabricators and craftspeople. HSZs can include high-density walk-up housing schemes. HSZs must include site and services plots with basic social infrastructure and services. All of these can be integrated with an open space system. In 1972, when the Housing and Urban Development Corporation was established in India, we call it HUDCO, I convinced them to focus on low-income groups, and I designed their very first scheme for the economically weaker section of society. In the early 1970s, in Chennai, as a World Bank consultant, I initiated and planned the Site and Services Program wherein 15,000 households were sold small serviced plots on which they built their own houses. This project morphed into the bank's global sites and services program. The program continues in Tamil Nadu today under the State Housing Board. When the, house, when the Hyderabad Urban Development Authority was created in 1976, I convinced them to build a workers' shelter township for the class four employees of their state government. We designed and built 2,000 housing units in the scheme with amenities and with community services. I suggest that in each town in Sri Lanka, the architect's fraternity ask a question, what if we have an integrated special habitat zone in our town? What if we propose to government a scheme integrating the functions of manufacturing skill development, and basic education, health, and shelter? What if each local institute chapter lays out a conceptual plan for a special habitat zone, or even smaller local enclaves, accommodating small plots of maybe 40 square meters each to be sold on long-term equated monthly installments to present hutment dwellers? These families can then build their own shelters with their own hands, obviating an expensive loan for unnecessary capital investment. As owner-builders, people will carefully evolve indigenous shelters, expressing their pride in their own homes, gifting them social status. 
There must be what-if competitions inviting architects, students, and local people to submit their ideas. Path three, creating access to basic health care services. People migrate to cities for work, medical services, and their children's basic education. Public health care systems operate through a vertical pyramid, a vertical structure of interrelated services. Basic health units are at the base of this pyramid, in neighborhoods, dealing with everyday concerns. If the base does not function, the entire pyramid fails. Basic health units refer their patients upwards to nodal facilities in urban districts where pathology labs and small operations can happen. This can be critical for women to survive when a cesarean birth is required or a child breaks a bone. More serious cases are referred on up the, to provincial hospitals or even to specialized hospitals in Colombo. These basic health care units are poorly designed. They are depressing places to visit for treatment. They are dysfunctional by design. They are not adequate places to dispense modern cures. The discomfort and turnoff factor at times of illness can add to many negatives, all adding up to a fatality. Ugly environments dissuade all of us from visiting facilities where we must go for survival. Here, architects can make amazing contributions, either proposing the upgradation of existing facilities are designing prototype facilities that will have a wide impact over time as replicable models. Over the past decades, private medical facilities have emerged for the urban elite, allowing us to forget that the vast majority of our fellow citizens cannot afford these facilities. We are tied in, but the people are left out. We can do pro bono work analyzing basic public health facilities in our communities we can start by making an audit of the spaces right from the reception, outpatient work areas, testing areas, on into the pathology labs, x-ray rooms, operation theaters, and wards. Our findings will be rather shocking to us. Here is where we need to reach across economic boundaries, make the lives of regular citizens more comfortable and even delightful. Here is where, by asking what if, we can make a huge impact on society. Our firm has just completed a major pro bono audit and plan for action of our 150 years old district hospital in our city. This is the largest public health facility in our metropolis having 1,500 beds. After asking what if, we began working pro bono. We worked with the doctors and we worked with the administrative staff to find the negatives, to find the positives, and to set out a future vision. The master plan that has evolved identifies heritage buildings that need restoration. We identified many dysfunctional buildings that were built in an ad hoc spirit that must be demolished. We identified new needs for staff housing, medical facilities, and supporting infrastructure. We studied the unconnected buildings and about seven separate plots of land, allowing options for linking functions together, increasing their efficiency. We showed how to add new required facilities in a step-by-step -step phased manner. Beginning with about two million square feet of dilapidated buildings on a chaotic campus, we suggested the demolition of about 600,000 square feet in careful steps, in tandem, we proposed adding 700,000 square feet of new facilities on a thought out priority basis. This document has become the basis for a large government grant and aid of about $20 million to revitalize the Essential Services Center. Our master plan is the basis of this new vision and in government investment in healthcare. The same procedure can be carried out by architects in the towns and cities of Sri Lanka. We must challenge each of our local architects associations to simply ask, what if? What if we carry out architectural audits of our government health care facilities and offer free advice as good citizens? You will all find the responses from doctors, from public administrators, and even from political leaders to be very positive. And they too will ask, what if? 
Path four, the education of an architect. This gathering is raising the critical question. Can architects be socially relevant, fostering social equity through design? This is a much neglected professional theme, and it is where a can-do attitude and commitment will enhance the role of our profession in public life. But our teaching of architecture falls short in this area, focusing more on high design skills, fancy presentations, Western contemporary architectural jargon, abstract thinking, and talking, rather than problem solving and doing. Three-dimensional software platforms have replaced simple sketching and diagramming skills so desperately needed in the design process. Following on the models of Western architectural historians and critics, students and faculty have learned how to talk design while falling short on skills and having no community or orientation. This is the doubtful gift of the global architectural fraternity that barely gives lip service to critical community needs. In our formative years of education, we were taught that the architect's role is to create elegant and poetic individual buildings. We were delighted by Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. We were delighted by Le Corbusier's Villa Savoy. We loved Philip Johnson's Glass House. We were taught to look abroad and not at home. Our imaginations were expanded by spectacular skyscrapers, amazing museums, and structural stunts created in the name of public art. Incredible as these iconic buildings appear, they are experienced by an irrelevant fraction of humanity. In reality, humanity is neglected by our international superstar architects, as well as we mortals practicing here in the subcontinent. We grew up imagining that Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City or that Le Corbusier's Radiant City offered answers to the questions I have raised in this discussion. They do not. Surely, Kinzo Tangi's harbor city floating off in Tokyo Bay offers little to humanity. It is fuzzy logic walking on water. Nor does Louis Kahn's Philadelphia plan offer anything to South Asia. We were also taught that architecture with a capital A is achieved while designing high-end seaside resorts or palatial bungalows with really expansive, beautiful gardens. We were misdirected by foreign critics that these wrong ideas were the right ones. These wrong designs, wrong images, and wrong role models have become a frustrating wrong met mental set of ideas guiding young students leading to nowhere. These models will not enable young designers to solve our society's most chilling urban lapses. Even the great man theory of who an architect should be and what he should become and what he should do is terribly wrong and it is a terribly wrong imported model. All of us grew up reading The Fountainhead, imagining ourselves as architect Howard Rourke. Howard Rourke still remains the fictional hero of most youngsters graduating from leading architectural schools. Without going into details here, I want to say that we must reevaluate the Western educational models we are following mindlessly across the subcontinent. We must recognize these curricula for what they are, post-independence, neo-colonial, cultural imperialism of our minds. We must ask, what if we totally abort our present curricula and teaching models completely? What if we start rethinking education afresh? We need to assess how we train professionals to be good and logical hands-on construction people instead of vague philosophers and abstract art designers. In the present scenario, the goal of fresh, of fresh graduates is to go abroad to the Architectural Association or to the Harvard Graduate School of Design to get a master's degree. This may cost $100,000 or even more. Why is this our vision and our goal? This is really nonsense. The education of architects needs to identify a critical set of skills 
a critical set of knowledge and critical sensitivities. These abilities must bring young architects into contact with the urban stresses that designed public facilities and designed public spaces can relieve. There is a clear package of skills needed for hands-on studio work. Sadly, youngsters arrive in our offices after five years of education modeled on Western curricula that does not prepare them to study their own context. It does not give them skills to analyze the gaps and lacuna in built fabric, allowing design skills to intervene, generating solutions. Graduates have no idea of what a construction site is like and what goes on there in a construction site. We clearly need graduates who have spent many months working on construction sites. We need fresh graduates who have worked as trainees in the offices of our subconsultants, like mechanical equipment designers and structural design firms. We need graduates who know how to analyze and design construction details using locally available materials and local techniques. We need to get students into our villages, into our slums, and into our low, lower middle class neighborhoods using social research methods to assess the gaps in infrastructure, the gaps in public space, the gaps in transportation, and the basic social facilities that are required. Craftspeople like masons, carpenters, and metal workers are literally unknown to our young graduates. Why? Students of medicine work in hospitals as assistants, amongst patients, as helpers to practicing doctors throughout their education. Maritime students are sent at sea on the ships early in their studies, moving back and forth between learning on the land and practicing at sea. Our master craftspeople used to teach understudies how to make sensitive buildings and how to work with their hands. I ask, what if we study these models of education and see what can be learned from them, developing more relevant curriculum for our future profession? Now I would like to end by asking a question. What if we dreamed in the daytime? I challenge our fraternity to stop dreaming while asleep and to awake, dreaming in the daytime, sparking public imagination. Cynics will counter me arguing that the architect's role is serving a tiny, tiny elite of boutique designers. They will say that our role is to teach good taste, spreading respect for poetry by example. Instead of asking, what if? They will be asking, how can we? We must ignore the cynics and be optimist proactively jumping into the public sphere, teaching civics by example. By exhibiting the possible, we will make the impossible a reality. I am not saying to jettison high design. I love high design. I am saying bring high design to the people. I am saying bring our beautiful gardens and landscapes into the public realm. I am saying let our health, primary health centers and primary schools be very beautiful places to be in. In my book, Letters to a Young Architect, I suggested something. I suggested we must understand that our talents and our wealth are only loaned to us in trusteeship to use towards the greater good. Let us become the trustees of our neighborhoods, the trustees of our cities, and the trustees of our regional ecosystems using our unique talents and skills showing the way forward. We should awake each morning and ask ourselves the simple question, what if we can make our communities better places to live in? Then we can start dreaming. Thank you so much. Be safe and be blessed.